A big time night in Los Angeles for women's basketball. Our Cameron Ruby was there to report on it. She's here to join us to talk about all things Pac-12 locked on women's basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Locked On Women's Basketball. Happy 2024 to you. I am host Howard McDonald. I want to thank you for making us your first listen every day. You guys keep showing up for us in record-breaking numbers, just as we show up for you six days a week. And, of course, it is not just me. It is the entire incredible team over at The Next. Go to thenextsoups.com for over 100 reported pieces Every month on the women's game, direct to your inbox. It's $9 a month, $72 a year to get the reporting that we all know the game deserves. And somebody who does an exceptional job of that is our contributing writer, Cameron Ruby. Cameron was live for UCLA's 71-64 win over USC, but there was a good deal more beyond just the score itself. Cameron, thanks for joining us. I want to start with an observation you made early in your story, which people can read over at thenetstoops.com, that people were there early. How rare is that in LA? Uh, Rare. Um, I'd say even, you know, you go to a Dodgers game and even the diehard fans are showing up after first pitch. So seeing the stadium full before you know warm-ups were over is unique it's exciting and it really set the tone for ucla early i think they fed off that and and it worked out to their advantage it is fascinating in segment one we're going to be talking a lot ucla and usc because in a lot of ways la is the epicenter of the current women's basketball world our michelle smith wrote about the pac-12 just today it was very interesting she said that East Coast bias is a thing of the past. Uh, honestly, you guys just need to figure out your time zone issue because Pacific time <laughs> is not real. But it does really feel as if we are seeing LA as a destination for women's college basketball in a way that, I, I mean, I don't know. You want to go back to Cheryl Miller? Like it's been a long time. Not like Corey uh, Close's program hasn't been really successful at UCLA for for years, but it does. It does seem different this year externally. You feel like that is a different feeling inside the arena now? A hundred percent. And I think Michelle said it really well that UCLA has been really constant. You know, they've been good for a long time. And then USC has had bits and pieces here and there. And we've all, those of us who've been watching the Pac-12 have just kind of been waiting for it all to fall into place for them in, in you know, at the same time. And I think that adding Juju to the mix, I mean, Juju Watkins, LA native, the crowd was excited for her the same way they were excited for UCLA. I won't say it was quite the same volume, but it was not that far off. And, um, you know, she brought a huge number of USC fans into the building. You could tell that there were a lot of people there who were just so excited to watch her play and, and see her energy and see her motor and all of that. So I think that, you know, USC has kind of been waiting for this moment. And the fact that it's happening at the same time that UCLA is number two in the country is just such a big deal for the sport in LA. It's really exciting. It's really important. I also very much wonder if people understand just how impressive Juju Watkins has been already. I want to share some stats and then get into your thoughts about just seeing her live. I'm very jealous you have got to do that. <laughs> yet to do it, but I am very much looking forward to the opportunity. Juju Watkins is averaging 26.8 points per game, which is a big deal in and of itself, but she is doing it with a level of efficiency that is seldom seen at any player, let alone a freshman. She's shooting 47.5% from two, 45.5% from three on five and a half attempts. Her assist percentage is 27.4%. She is turning the ball over 14.7%, essentially a two-to-one ratio between those two. That is just unheard of as a freshman, let alone a freshman who is being guarded this 
much. What do you see from Juju's game early on? What stood out to you specifically in this UCLA game? Well, I'm going to steal it from her coach because I think she said it really well that like things did not go Juju's way in the first quarter. You know, Charisma Osborne is playing like full deny defense on her. That's one of the most elite defenders to me in the Pac-12 and maybe the country. And Juju Watkins ended up, you know, turning it on in the second quarter. She ended up drawing eight fouls in the game, which I think is like a testament to the fact that she kind of adjusted. And when things weren't falling, she found other ways to work. Um, she was like fighting around Lauren Betts for every single rebound. I mean, I think seeing her in person and seeing kind of the energy and the poise that she plays with, it was really different actually than seeing it on TV. She had three fouls like pretty early in the game and the trust that coach Gottlieb had to leave her in and let her play through it in like the biggest matchup they've had this year is sort of a testament to what she's already seeing. And then what we all got to see on Saturday too, just the leadership and the calm from Juju. That's the thing. And and UCLA, and we'll get to UCLA, there's so many offensive weapons, but there's so many two-way weapons. You know, Charisma Osborne, her D was going to get her into the lead before this. Now the fact that she's shooting north of 40% from three is a thing she specifically worked on. <laughs> takes her to a different level altogether. But you go back to, you know, Lindsay Gottlieb trusting Juju this much this soon. That's something you'd expect. Yeah from an upperclassman. So, you know, yeah, UCLA made her work hard for it, but she also didn't seem like she was forcing it at any part of this game along the way. Do you think ultimately that, you know, and Michelle touched on it today, there's so many standout players and some upperclassmen who are standout players, even, you know, a sophomore like Lauren Betts in the player of the year conversation. Juju's got to be in there too, though, right? I know she's a freshman. I think it's pretty clear she's going to win freshman of the year, probably nationally, but she's got to be in the player of the year conversation too, right? I think she does. I think that another testament to that is that she didn't come out of the game um, until there was a minute 10 left and she left because she had a cramp. Um, Everyone, you know, did a big sigh of relief when she came back out to the bench with a few Mm -hmm. seconds left. But I think, you know, if she's going to play all game, every game and make the kind of impact that she has. I think you just can't really deny, you know, the strength that that requires and the talent that that requires. And I think I said it before, but the motor um, that that requires, like the movement that she has on the court, you just, you can't really, you can't look away from that. It's just so impressive. But again, so is UCLA on the defensive end and uh, segment two, we'll get into more of the offensive weapons, but they are seventh in points per 100 possessions so far this season. And obviously the offense is at a level beyond even some of Corey's best teams. You, you know, you look and it's not like UCLA has either a struggled to make noise in the tournament and they win games routinely or sent players on to the pros, whether it's Jordan Canada, Monique Billings, uh, Michaela on your where the list goes on and on. But I just think I've talked to people across the, sport that think this is Corey's best team. It's this is a top 50 defensive team. They are 42nd in opposing points per 100 possessions. How much of that though is just Lauren Betts, who I, I looked into this is nine feet tall and just in <laughs> shots uh, as sort of looming in, uh, in reserve and how much of it is how good they are on the ball, particularly for his Osborne. Yeah, I mean, I think the combination of Charisma Osborne and Lauren Betts is something special on the defensive end. I mean, I think if you have someone like Charisma Osborne who can play with somebody like Juju, who's who's bigger than her, and play deny defense for, you know, the majority of the game, just completely trying to keep the ball out of her hands, and then you have Lauren Betts as your help, you know, in the paint, if she does get by you, like, What's better than that? So I think that's absolutely true. But I also think something that's interesting about UCLA to me is that they're ready for the steal all the time. So when their their team has faith in charisma in particular, I think, and something that I've noticed is, you know, if she's getting the steal, she's getting the deflection up near the top of the key, they're running. Like they, she's running, they're ready to look for her. They're ready to pass to her. And I think some teams don't play like that. Some teams get the steal and are like, okay, we did it. Here we go. Slow it down. And they're not doing that. I think the first two deflections of the game she scored on, and that's just a momentum moment for them. Like there's no, when you're UC, when you're USC, that's defeating. Like that, the whole first quarter was dictated by those two deflections in, in my mind is 
you know, she was keeping the ball out of their best player's hand, disrupting their offense. And not only that, but she was scoring as a result. It's huge. It makes an enormous difference. Uh, again, it will not be shocking to me if we see UCLA win it all. They are in that list for me of teams I think can do it. So we'll be back sure. talking more about UCLA and on the offensive side, what they're doing as well. Uh, but first, I want to talk to you guys about prize picks. And prize picks is a really interesting, well, first of all, it's the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, but it's really interesting the way in which they let you play. Let me just tell you if you don't know about it, okay? So you have this ability to pick any two to six players in a given day, any of the sports the prize picks does, okay? You're playing against yourself. You're not playing against other teams. It's the combo projections. So you select between two and six players, and then if you selected correctly, you win. And what something that I love that they have is an ability to do something called the specials lead. It's a lead that gives you combo projections, right? So let's say you have an NFL hunch and an NBA hunch. You could combine LeBron James and Travis Kelsey for a 10.5 combination of three pointers made and receptions. So just, you know, it makes it even more fun. You can also play against prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill, the comedian Andrew Schultz. Just find them in the community plays under the promos tab. How can you do this? Go to prizepitch.com slash locked on NBA. And we have a special offer. Use code locked on NBA for a first deposit match of up to a hundred dollars. Again, prizepitch.com slash L O C K E D O N N B A for a first deposit match of up to a hundred dollars. Prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. So we're going to have to talk about the slumping Lauren Betts, who has seen her field goal percentage this year drop all the way down to <laughs> 4.1%. I mean, it, can UCLA win if she's missing almost one, you know, slightly more than one in four shots? Such a disappointment. <laughs> um, you could talk to Corey Close probably about that, but I think that um... – I think that if we learned anything on Saturday, it's if we didn't already know that you just like cannot play behind her, even when she's missing more shots than normal, which like you said, is not a lot of shots. Um, she's getting to the line. She's getting offensive rebounds. I mean, she's, I can't, I don't have the number in front of me for Saturday, but she's getting assists. She's kicking it back out. Like she's not, even when she's less efficient than her usual, there's by no means is she ever inefficient. <laughs> No, oh, and and again, you talked about it in defending her. There's not a real answer to it, which is to say that uh, we had a chance to see her live here on the East Coast during the Mohegan Sun triple header. And Florida State and Brooke Wyckoff, who's a very, very strong defensive minded coach, tried just about everything, you know, playing behind her, fronting her, bringing over the double on the kick, bringing over the double immediately. It almost didn't matter. And part of that, and the reason it doesn't matter in part, is as simple as there are so many weapons to take it back out to as well. But she just, at six foot seven, I don't feel like people fully understand what she is as a player, because it's not just a six foot seven, there's a physicality to what she does that I don't think you often see in college bigs. You, you know, from, from your perspective, what kind of stands out to you about seeing the way she plays just in a day-to-day? -day, if there's a play that stands out, if there's a moment that stands out, I'm just wondering what that was like for yeah. you. Well, I think both coaches after the game talked a lot about how this was a physical game. Um, and it was funny because they both kept saying they need to match the physicality of each other. So, um, you know, when that happens, it's, it's just elevated and it's fun. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. And I think the other thing about Lauren is that she can stay on the floor. So she played, I think, more than 30 minutes on Saturday. I think she played 33, 33 or 34 minutes. And I think that that's something else that we're not seeing from a lot of bigs because, um, you know, foul trouble, stamina, all of that. And so she plays with a new stamina this year, I think, that allows her to fight on rebound. So not only is she getting positioned 
around these guards and, and other posts that are, you know, fighting around her for the ball, but she's in the right spot. She's boxing out and then she's able to fight for the ball. So I think that, you know, her being able to stay on the floor, her being able to keep her energy up and compete for every ball rather than just, you know, having it fall into her hands is, is also huge. I guess the flip side of that is it's not on her alone. And you pointed out, you know, that, that game was decided with London Jones hitting that fifth three of the game, which put UCLA up seven, uh, around four minutes to go. And that was it. You know, there, there was yeah. no real coming back from that. London Jones is north of 40% from three, as is Charisma Osborne, as we mentioned previously. You know, is there I, – I'm struck by the difference between what Aaliyah Boston needed to do in South Carolina last year offensively, given the lack of perimeter shooting, and what we're able to see from Lauren Betts. Do you feel like we're almost getting a sneak preview of what Betts can be at the WNBA level because of that? I think that's true. And I think that she's has this supporting cast that we can't even really call a supporting cast because yeah. when you have players like Charisma Osborne who have been their number one scoring option for years combined with now new Lauren Betts and Kiki Rice, who's, you know, coming off a great year and probably about to have a better one. Yeah. You, you can't even say that they're her supporting cast. It's just the cast. Right. So I think the other thing about that is that yes, Lauren Betts had eight rebounds on Saturday, but like, London Jones had seven. So when we talk about help, not just for shooting, but when the ball's bouncing around, they know Lauren's going to be in position and keeping the posts on the other team from getting the ball. But they have all these guards who have incredible speed and quickness who are able to come in and snatch up those loose balls. I mean, London Jones is one of the smallest players on the court and she's ending the game with seven rebounds. Like you can have faith in your guards, both on offense and on defense um, to, to pick up where, you know, you're, you're just doing your job and they're going to do more than theirs too. They're going to miss Charisma Osborne next year. <laughs> she makes it to the league, but UCLA is not going to be in rebuilding mode. I mean, Lauren Betts, a sophomore, London Jones, a sophomore, Kiki Rice, a sophomore, UCLA with a lot more to come. I'm going to ask you for a feels, though, rather than a stat question or a team question, which is to okay. say to see UCLA and USC in this moment, having this moment, a Pac-12 moment in what is the last year of the Pac-12. Was it bittersweet for you? I know this is a conference that means a lot to you. Yeah, it was. I think I've grown up. I grew up watching the Pac-12 Um you know, through all of its ups and downs of, of the women's game, there have been years where everyone's been competitive and then there have been years where it's kind of had pits. And I think that having this be the final year is both um, really sad and also really hopeful. Like I haven't seen a crowd like that for a women's basketball game in LA um, ever. And so I think that being able to go out like this, but also remember that these two teams are going to get to keep playing each other every year mm -hmm. um, is a big deal. And we get to do it again in two weeks. So I think that remembering that, you know, this is kind of a, an exciting moment in that it's the end of something, but I also think we can't let that be, you know, the cause of momentum loss. It has to mm -hmm. keep going just because the PAC 12 is going away. doesn't mean these two teams aren't going to continue to compete with each other at a high level and do so twice a year. So um, I think that's huge. No question about it. And again, it's huge for the big 10, the big 10, which again, we know the extent to which football drives all of this. But if you think about it purely from a women's basketball perspective to have Los Angeles matter, in terms of this growth of the sport for the Big Ten seems like a very big deal. And as we're trying, and frankly, I don't know exactly what it's all going to mean, but to try and fathom what these national, truly coast-to-coast -coast conferences mean, it matters a great deal in the same way that I absolutely believe that Rutgers needs to grow as well, that there needs to be that East Coast and Northeast fl a flag planted so and, and so that's the most important thing, I think, is what it comes down to. I don't I don't mean to speak with any East Coast bias, but the most <laughs> important part is that both USC and UCLA will be visiting Piscataway every other year. Right. Isn't that <laughs> speaking not a myopic view of it at all? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I appreciate the support for that. Clearly. <laughs>
post bias. Well, we'll be back because there is a lot more to talk about in the Pac-12. We're going to get into some of the early sleepers as well. But first, excited to talk to you about FanDuel. FanDuel, even though the NFL season is wrapping up, there is still time to get in on the action. And FanDuel has this excellent offer. I have to be honest, though, it's not one that maybe the Philadelphia Eagles are best positioned to help you take care of. New customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That is $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. So they've moved away from the only if you win, you get 150 bucks. So the Eagles are a little better position than they were. Eagles have lost four of five uh, here in the Philadelphia area. Uh, mass panic has set in. People are wearing black everywhere they go. Um, so Eagles are coming up the game this weekend against the Giants. Both games uh, the game matters to both teams. If the Eagles win, they still have a chance to win the NFC East. If the Giants lose and three other things happen, they can get the second overall pick in the 2024 draft. So very exciting times for Giants fans as well. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and make that first bet. Get your opportunity. Once you do it, you can bet on so many different things. Same game parlays. Uh, you, you can have over-unders as well. A lot of different options because FanDuel, of course, offers these as the official partner of the NFL. So it is true. I looked it up. There are other Pac-12 teams outside of Los Angeles. <laughs> and so I want to talk a little bit about them. One of them to me that really stands out is Oregon State. Big win in, I know we're not calling it the Civil War anymore, the win over Oregon, uh, 65-41, I believe the score was. Take me through, what are we seeing out of Oregon State so far this year? They, I, I mean, who are their losses to, first of all? Uh, they don't have any. They don't um, have any. <laughs> yeah, I think Reagan Beers uh, continues to be really good. The Pac-12 post game is going to be so fun to watch like ring and beers Cameron Brink, Lauren Betts like you just have all these really elite post players that are gonna you know battle down low I think that um I think Oregon State's gonna be interesting to see because they do have this momentum I mean being undefeated is a really big deal I don't care who you play against uh just going into conference play having that confidence and having that momentum is probably gonna pay off really high for them and they have a very deep team. Uh, it's uh, Scott Ruick is not playing anybody more than Kelsey Rees at 26.5 minutes per game. That is allowing people to stay fresh late. That's obviously going to matter when you get to the Pac-12 play and you're dealing with a lot of those Friday, Sundays. <laughs> you know, in terms of beers, just to, to your point, she is shooting 70.4% from the field. Again, like, you yeah. know, <laughs> When you look at, you know, that level of efficiency, we're used to seeing, all right, who is the center for Iowa? She's going to be the leading uh, efficiency uh, center yeah. in the country, whoever it is, you know, and yeah. in this case, you have multiple and, and generally in the mid to upper 60s from the field. And in this case, having, you know, having beers at 70.4, having bets at 74.6. It's going to be fascinating once you get into conference play to see where those numbers end up. But they're not doing it by accident. Beers, of course, 19.6 points per game, 11.9 rebounds as well. But to your point, there are a lot of sleepers, and it seems like that makes things more difficult for teams who are having any sort of trouble. You know, Utah seems to really be feeling it. They had that loss to Colorado uh, and Gianna Neepkins, we knew would be a massive loss, but uh, you know, what do you think Utah needs to do to reassert itself as, you know, one of those teams that finishes at or near the top of the Pac-12? I think they need to stay healthy. I mean, obviously that's a kind of a gimme answer, but I think like they just cannot afford to, to lose more of their rotation. I feel like they're a team that functions so well on that like perimeter passing. And when they lose a piece of that, it's hard to come back from, but they're another team. I mean, Alyssa Peely is so good. 
I, she's so fun to watch. And I just, I can't say like, you know, beyond like, that's, that's the bottom line. She's so good. And she's able to do so many things. I mean, thinking about posts in this league, like she's not a post, she's not a guard. I, I don't know what she is. She's everything. So I think like thinking about her and matching up with these players too, like this is just going to be continued fun. She, I feel like she's both instead of neither. Yeah. I feel like she's <laughs> use the improv uh, formulation. Yeah. Such a yes and player. Yes. Like, well, that's and, kind of what I meant by she's everything. Like she's no, I know, everything. I know. I, and and you're not wrong. I, I I just, you know, she had a year for the ages last yeah. year. And she's crushing her numbers from last year. Like she was 62% from the field from two last year. She's at 75.7% from the field from two this year. She's making almost yeah. half the threes and she's taking more than four attempts per game from three. I wrote about her a couple of weeks ago about the fact that WNBA teams have come to realize, oh, we do have to pay close attention to her. I mean, it's, some people are late to the party. You know, I've been talking about her for quite a while, but uh, she is just somebody who has to be seen to be believed. And even though the Pac-12 plays these games much too late because of the ridiculous time zone <laughs> that the Pac-12 exists in, I'm telling you guys, I've already budgeted for it in my emotional well-being. I'm going to have to miss some sleep. I'm just going to have to do yeah. it. This lead is absolute must see top to bottom. I, 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 it's I, I worth it. it. It really, it is worth, <laughs> it's worth it. I can't stress that enough. Well, Cameron Ruby, you're doing such great work. I'm delighted you, are you. We're doing it the next. Thank you for being with us and sharing your Pac 12 thoughts to our listeners. Thank you for making us your first listen every day. We will, of course, be back with you tomorrow as we are six days a week. So until next time, I am Howard Magdal wishing all of you a wonderful day. Welcome to Wallet. For the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball.